Okay. Yep. Kind of take the boom startup model or some of those, but move it a little bit further, a little bit more advanced than your brand brand new. Yep. So, yeah. 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 Should, should be good. Should be fun. So, Ben, I have the thing here. If you want to take the HDMI cable. Yeah. Yeah, just be here to reach this that corner there. Yeah, that's funny. You're supposed to present from the middle, I guess, is their intent. I did. Yeah. <laughs> so. No signal. Make sure that doesn't go out to any other land developers, please. <laughs> Not a word. Um, okay, so for people that have their laptops that can hear me, I posted a link. It's bit.ly slash data dork. Figured that was easier than a bunch of random letters. So if you type that in, you can get access to a notebook that I'm going to be talking through. Um, i seeing that. Oh, you're not seeing that? I, I posted it. Um, it was... Go down to the bottom right. Bottom right, down here? Yeah. Oh. Then you go to screen share. Here, I'll post that one. Okay. Yeah, yeah I... So it's bit.ly slash data dork. Is that your hashtag too? No. <laughs> no. It should be though, right? Okay. So I, I guess before I jump into this, I'll give some background on well, who I am. I mean though is on the share. It's on the share. Seeing that screen, it's in your face. Oh. So you need to go to screen share. Oh. Yeah, right there. Go to screen share over here. Okay. And yeah. share that. That can I just do your entire screen? Yeah. Okay. Good. There we go. And then minimize. Uh oh. Yeah. There we go. Now I'll make sure. So if you type in bit.ly backslash data dork, you can see this notebook. Let me know if if someone could just test it for me, let me know. You can see it. It's called NLP underscore example. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, okay, so real quick, my background. So I'm the chief data scientist for a local startup called HireView. Um, so I so my background has been chemical engineering. There is nothing about my job that involves chemical engineering <laughs> at all, not even close. And so I, I started working for the Micron, um, the Intel Micron plant in Lehigh. I am Flash. I worked there for five years too long. And then I went and worked for a hedge fund for a year. And that's where I really got the fire hose for data science because we had a million dollar GPU cluster learned a lot about validation because if I have a stock model, so one of the things I'll appreciate until I die is validation. So if you come to me and you say, my model is 80% accurate or it's getting an AUC of 0.9. In finance, that's a big deal because there's millions of dollars that can be made. If you're wrong, your hands could be cut off. Like that's kind of, <laughs> yeah. that's what it feels like. Push out of that. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, so I, I did that for a year, went back to IM Flash for a year, and then I ended up at HireVue. So I run their data science group. Since working there, I've hired two data scientists that work for me. Um, so I, I have some perspective on the hiring side, so I can talk about what I look for and what some red flags would be and what some encouraging things might be, and feedback I might give someone who, because I, because I, I still say that degree doesn't matter. I don't care about degree or background. But the funny thing about that is the, the two people I have hired have had PhDs. But it's not because they had PhDs. They were they had the strongest technical competency out of the entire hiring pool. Um, but we would have been happy to hire a high school dropout if they had had the strongest technical competency in the hiring pool. And I can talk about what, what those competencies are and what we look for. That would definitely be good to do. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. 
Okay, uh, maybe I'll go through that real quick then, since we we're uh, on topic. So one of, so I care a lot more about breadth than depth. So if you are a rock star at support vector machine, you can code it up from scratch, you can distribute it, you can do all this stuff with it, you know the theory behind it, and you can put in some crazy constraints. That's fine, but the other kid that you're interviewing against has more breadth than you have. So if I say natural language processing, image processing, audio processing, um, distributed Python, they, they just touched a lot more problems. And you don't have to do Kaggle, but one of our last hires had been doing a, a ton of Kaggle, like 21 competitions. And the thing that that gave him is it gave him an incredible amount of breadth. Because if we throw out a problem type on the table, right now we're going to be looking at email classification. He's already dealt with it. He's dealt with multiple variations. And then... Was he really high in the leaderboards? Or was he, he, was, he was ranked top 100 in the world. Okay, wow. Out of, and I think there's 400,000. You're talking about Tiam? Or something? Yeah. Is that his taste? Uh, we call him Jamin. Jamin, yeah. Jamin. Yeah. 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 And then the other hire, uh, Keith, he got a degree in physics, which physics, mm -hmm. um, but he spent the entire year retooling himself. So instead of going from physics into a job, he went from physics and he spent the whole year going to meetups, going to all these different events, trying to learn everything he could, and he had the strongest technical competency out of a very large pool of candidates. Um, so being familiar with SQL, if you've never done anything with SQL, I'd recommend doing something. It doesn't have to be big. You don't have to have a huge project, but just saying, I have stood up a SQL database, I can hit it with R, I've hit it with Python, that that ticks off on the breadth requirement. So if I have like 20 breadth buckets, SQL, uh, natural language processing, image processing, audio processing, distributed, multi-node computing. Um, I distributed, are you talking Hadoop and Spark, or because you use GPUs, right? Yeah, well, just being, because a lot of times with real problems, you'll run into, um, you run into hard constraints on this machine does not have enough memory to do X, or this machine does not have enough CPU power to do Y this week. And so it really helps. The thing that helps with that is are people with cloud experience, and they, they don't have to have cloud experience for their job. Like Jamin and Keith, they tinkered on the cloud. So that's very useful. That's helpful. And so I, I had confidence that they can go fire up multiple instances, and they can get the work done. If they've never fired up a single instance, so right now I'm running this on the Amazon cloud. If they're not familiar with that process, then that would probably hurt them in the interview process. And the thing I recommend is just, you know, they have nano instances now. They're like, yeah, how much are they a month? Like seven bucks a month? They're, yeah. it, like they're so cheap. Three per year. Three oh, yeah. So, well, not if it, you can't for, run the properties. So you, you yeah, so if you're just doing kind of little proof of concepts, then that ticks off that breadth thing where if I ask you, do you have any experience with distributed computing? Yeah, I've, you know, I, I've done this or that. Um, and then it, one of the, it really helps if someone has a passion. So if, if you're coming with 20 years of statistical experience and I'm able to poke a few holes in your armor, so, you know, kind of asking you like some of the latest questions, well, what about this, what about that? If I can't tell that you're passionate about the topic, then that's a big concern for me. But if you're passionate, I've poked a few holes, then fine. Like I, I know you're going to learn that. You're going to go to the meetups. You're going to read online. As soon as the new algorithm comes out, you're going to be using it. So people that are really passionate, they excel. They do really well. They they don't need any coaching. So, I, it, so I'd recommend just falling in love with it. And I don't know. Hopefully some of that is useful. I've written blogs about it. So if you, Maybe I can post that at the end. I'll post a few links to blogs where there's been a lot more in-depth focus on what I look for and why people get jobs and why people don't. I think passion is the biggest reason people don't get jobs. So when you're interviewing, why are you less passionate than the next person? And how would I detect that? And, and breadth could be one of those. So then if I could ask you related to Pat's question before about creativity. Yes. The creativity side of these people that you hire. Do you know? Um, you find out later. So it, if you have that, that's interesting because if you have a ton of breadth, that can kind of 
you can, can you, can, you can almost fake creativity because yeah. if I if we have a problem we're stuck and let's say you are genuinely creative you're gonna figure out a way to get around it mm -hmm. but this let's say me I'm not I'm really not creative that creative experience. but I have so much breadth and experience I'm gonna just say well this one time I did this or this is kind of like this other problem that's not even in this domain space yeah. it's over here in an image processing they do data augmentation how about we do data augmentation and it's not because I'm creative it's just because I've I've seen the world of data and I can speak to it but I, I think creativity so I don't think everyone in the organization needs to excel at creativity but someone does because the creativity piece a data science will never be blocked that's kind of my like I'll, I'm happy to hire people that do get blocked and I work them through it a really good data scientist they're never blocked so that creativity piece is key and either it's coming from a lot of breadth a ton of arrogance <laughs> and ambition to see it through no matter what and so if you're hit with a new problem and that's a big deal I, I, I guess I don't know how to the only way I measure creativity is with breadth um, and I, I have asked it, so in interviews I have asked, I've tried to kind of get to the core of simple algorithms, because a lot of people use least squares re regression, but if you actually like corner them and try to really talk through what the algorithm is doing and what it what it does, they like, it's a convex optimization problem with an analytical solution that was derived using matrix algebra. Like the majority of people that interview, they don't, they don't know, they don't know the background on the algorithm. So that was something we used to try to but again, that's kind of getting to back towards experience and passion. If you love what you're doing, you're passionate about it, you're going to understand XG Boost and Random Forests. And um, the reason we brought that question up is we liked that because it was an indicator to us that people wouldn't get blocked. Because sometimes with real data, I'll be solving a problem and I'll realize there's something about this problem that totally breaks everything I've used in the past. So. One example would be I'm solving a model, but all of my parameters have to be positive. So I, normally I just take a bunch of data, do least squares regression. Some are negative, some are positive. But what if I have a constraint where actually these all have to be positive? You're going to have a really hard time. Like SK Learn, vanilla is not going to give that to you. So you have to actually understand well, it's an optimization problem. This is a constraint. I'm kind of getting into the weeds, but that's that's like one example where. Um, someone who's creative, they can get around that. They're not going to be blocked. They'll figure out, how about we not do least squares regression? How about we do something similar with a few hacks? I, and I, that's something that comes up with data science is kind of this hacky concept. Mm -hmm. They're really good at statistics. They're really good at programming, but there's also this hacking mentality um, where they, they can kind of you know, build stuff out of nothing and make it work. I so how you put that though too with the whole creativity not to get us too far into that but um you basically said data scientists don't ever get blocked or they get blocked but then they find a way, they find a way around the roadblock yeah whether it's through creativity breadth of experience something they find a way to make it work yeah and that's and that's that creativity that i'm kind of talking about too creative people may have it a little bit easier right at the first because maybe they find some great creative solution mm -hmm. but if somebody that knows it and is passionate about it's still going to figure it out yeah, so it's systems thinking, right? Yeah, whether your approach to fixing it is by coming up with something brand new or going back to what you're familiar with already, yeah. you're really seeing it as a broader system that you can be aware of and find the right approach to things. Or yeah, not approach to things like that. So, yeah. yeah, and that that can also come back and burn you. So something that's really important during the interview process is we hate it when people reinvent the wheel. Yeah, right. So. If you're if you're really really smart and you're going down this path and and then we realize you've just kind of you've spent hours doing something that should have taken you seconds mm -hmm. where you're reinventing the well and and we're actually dealing with this right now with distributed deep learning which I'll talk about is I I've always before I got into the space I assumed Spark and H2O was the norm because that has a lot of hype mm -hmm. but apparently Spark does not support convolutional nets which is mm -hmm. a killer for anyone doing anything with image or audio, mm -hmm. Spark H2O is kind of off limits now. Mm -hmm. And so we're, yeah. there's another one called MXNet that can do it, but mm -hmm. th that's something, 
So we were faced with this discussion, do we reinvent, do we write distributed deep learning from scratch, which we have the expertise to do, or do we make sure that we're not, like there's always the, the cost yeah. associated with that. In, yeah. 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 So and also knowing the trajectories of these things, because they're probably built it into Spark at some point. Yeah. Well, so reading in the community, there's, there, no one's, no one's yelling for convolute, like, I imagine people are yelling for convolution lets in Spark and H2O, but it's not on the roadmap. Like it hasn't been committed to. Where MXNet is getting a ton of followers. Some of the people from XG Boost are supporting it. And TensorFlow came out from Google. It was just a big mess with memory issues and it doesn't support the CUDA drivers that you run on Amazon. And so TensorFlow, it's so right now MXNet, TensorFlow, or go do your own custom thing and make sure you do it in Keras. Um, but so something I wanted to give you guys as a takeaway, it, which is why I gave you this link. So um, Nick mentioned there's some interest in natural language processing. And before we jump into this, I'm also going to talk about deep learning, but there is there should not be a problem out there that intimidates you when it comes to prediction. So whether it's audio, you're trying to do like, voice fingerprinting or you're trying to do you've got all this text coming from newspapers or email or you've got just website code and you're trying to do like a web content filter or you're trying to do image or video there shouldn't be a data type that intimidates you there, there might be right now but all of these data types they share the same you follow the same steps every time so you start with the raw data and somehow you have to structure that so if I'm dealing with a video, I can't use a video. When it comes to modeling time, those have to be converted to numbers. And so text is pretty, that's a nice entry into this discussion because this is totally unstructured. You can see this email example. This thing is a mess. It has some tags in there, it has emails, it has words. I can't do a least squares regression on this. I can't do a random forest on this. I can't do anything with this right now. So regardless of the data type you're dealing with, you're always going to um, structure it. And so in the case of audio, audio is already kind of, you've got, you've got this time series, so I'm going to take a window. There, I just structured it. I've got a window of time that I'm dealing with. With text, I'm going to map these to numeric representations. So instead of words and tags, you're going to just see numbers. And those numbers can be converted to a sparse matrix. Um, and so Whenever you're intimidated with a data set and you're thinking, how on earth do I build a predictive model from my LinkedIn profile, which has an image and it has text? You just you always start with the building blocks. Somehow you have to structure it. The entire thing has to be converted to some numerical format. In the case of image and text, I would just split those out into two different models. Uh, image would be deep learning and text you can also be deep, deep learning. So let's, I'm gonna zoom in. We're gonna look at this. Um, and if anyone wants to follow along, you have this link, so if you actually open this up in your browser, just make a copy. So is if you there go like to a password on this? There, no, there's no password. What, what are people using to access this? Oh, oh, that. Oh. Yeah. Did, that, did that work for everybody? Yes. Real quick, too, one question that Jim had was, do you use Open MPI at, at all at hierarchy? Um, we do not right now. Um, no, we don't. Well, if you do connect, yeah. just make a copy. Yeah. So that way you can kind of play around with it and start executing. So this is Python, and this is mm -hmm. this is a Python notebook, which is now Jupyter. So you can install this on your local machine, or you can install it um, on Amazon. You can go set up a nano instance, which I'd recommend if you've never started an Amazon instance, and go s install IPython and get the security groups working so you can actually see this in your browser. So this is running on Amazon. If you actually want to see where it's running, this is, this is my personal Amazon account. This is the instance. It's a GPU instance. I can come here and click on security group, and then I can control which IPs are allowed to see this machine. So I'm allowing port 9999 to be accessed from anywhere. 
I could constrain it to a specific IP and then also port 22 for SSH. So if you're not familiar with the Amazon um, console, I would suggest coming in here and playing. You can see I've, I've got a bunch of micro nodes and just fire this up and SSH into it and see if you can get this, get a IPython notebook, notebook working. So this is a great uh, text problem to start with. So I really like, in sklearn data sets, you don't have to go digging around on the internet to find data, uh, which you can go get from different repositories. Mm -hmm. They've already pre-processed the, like the data is in a nice expected format to you to, for you to work with quickly. Mm -hmm. So there's the Boston housing data set, there's the Iris flower data set, there's a bunch of data sets uh, that are built right into this sklearn data set. So by doing fetch 20 news groups, I'm gonna do this pipeline thing, which we'll talk about in a minute. So what I'm telling it is I'm telling it, I want two, get, two categories of emails. I want it to pull all the data and I'm going to shuffle the data. Um, I didn't have to shuffle the data, but I just, they've got a flag in the function, I shuffled it. And so if we actually look at this data set, it's a list and I, we're just looking at one entry and it has this. So you can see, I love the constitution with this land, CTO, pages, software. Uh, so this is, I see Brigham Young University in here and some mention of the LES church, which is kind of funny because it's like, this is worldwide. <laughs> this is a text example that all data science <laughs> scientists use. Wow. And it's that's pretty cool. About bastards. <laughs> no, bastards. Yeah. <laughs> so you have to bring shuffle. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, so the categories I picked, because I picked uh, atheism and, right. and yeah, Christian. Yeah. So there's there's like 20 different categories. So you can, right now I'm doing binary classification. So I have to predict if it's one or the other. So this text mm -hmm. is totally worthless right now. I can't, and if I want to look at the, uh, like if I want to look at the type, you'll see it's just a list. So, but the list, and if I want to look at the length, there's 1,796 entries. So that's how many observations we have. And for the, for the Y, it's just a binary one or zero. That's telling me if it's one category or the other. And so between these two, atheism yeah. and Yeah, yep. So it's between the two, and we're trying to predict if, given an email, we want to predict if it falls into this category or the other. And for this simple example, this suddenly opens the door to a bunch of real world text problems. So a spam filter. So this Python code right here, if you had the spam, that's the, a lot of times that's the problem. You have to get the labeled set. So somehow, and I'll talk about tricks to get labeled sets if they're big and expensive. There's, I'll show you an example of deep learning where we built a really big one quickly. So if you have a labeled set of 10,000 spam emails and 10,000 regular emails, you can follow this example and build a pretty good model that is near production ready. It won't be, and something you guys should always think about and ask is, once we finish the example, well, how do we make it better? And that's something you can always ask. And I'll try to have an answer for it. How, how do you make this better? So, so we know we can't use the X. So this, this pipeline function is pretty powerful. Um, before I jump into what it's doing, this is actually advanced, a little bit more advanced than I'd want to be. So. There's a function called count vectorizer, and it can, we're going to start the, we have to initialize this class, so we're going to call it um, vectorize. So I can actually take this, so the text is still text, but if I take this and I run the text object through there, um, and I, I'm going to do a fit, so something that's common in sklearn is this I did a fit, transform, fit, and transform. And so what this is doing is if I do if I do a fit, it's just going to fit that text to some matrix that I'll use. If I use fit, transform, I can now pass text through there. And can you guys see this OK? Whoa, making it really big now. So if I just do this function call, what so it, it completed, but I want to show you what it did. So it took that ugly text, and it made it into a matrix, which is a sparse matrix, which is 
26,135 columns. So what on earth is that? So the columns actually represent unique word usage in the email, and it could even be tags. It could be weird stuff, or like if you're doing a Twitter data. You're just parsing on space. Yeah, it's just it's parsing on space. It's going to build out this huge thing, this huge matrix. And the other thing that's interesting is if I look at the type, this is actually a compressed sparse column format matrix. So not only did Python make a matrix for me, but they were nice about it because they know we're dealing with text, and this is going to really crap out my memory, right. especially if you're dealing with a big set. So they automatically made it sparse. And what that means is it's just the, uh, the data object I'm dealing with, they haven't actually saved zeros to disk right. or in memory. They just they saved pointers. So it's, think of it as like a list object. You don't really, you can treat it like a matrix. So I've got this matrix. Now I've got something I can do something with. You could do at least squares regression on this. I could do random forest on this. And so something that is a little bit more advanced, the first thing just returned counts. So it returned the counts of the words. So how many times did they say the word the? How many times did they say the word um, cat? And I have different counts in that sparse matrix. But that's not really useful because if you say the word, like, and this is a common thing whenever you're doing any machine learning, you really want to give the algorithm the unique differences. And so this is true with deep learning, it's true with text. Just because you said the word the 100 times, that's really not that interesting. I want, I want to pull out what's different between the different observations. And so this next thing is actually going to transform it based on the frequency that that's used. And so what that ends up giving me, when it's modeling time, I can actually tell, are you using the more often than other people? Are you using cat less often than other people? So I actually get a frequency for that word use. And what I've done is I've essentially normalized the data set. And this is really important in deep learning. When I'm dealing with, I do the same thing with images. So if I have an image of a cat and a dog, I want the stuff I, fit, I send to the deep learning, to the algorithm, I want it to be what what is most different about this image than other images? And so what they do is they demean. I'll build up a mean image that represents all 50,000 images I've ever seen, and I'll subtract it out. And you might say, well, why would you do that? Because what you end up with is just kind of this crappy image mess. Well, no. What I'm sending to the algorithm is what is most unique right. about this image. It's like a Z score. Uh, yeah, so anytime you can demean. Um, it really helps. The most relevancy-based engines, though, are just looking at word count. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they're picking up. Yeah. And this. Especially on like resume parsers. Yeah. And uh, and I'll and I want to get to quickly what state of the art is here because this is this is NLP 101. Mm -hmm. So they call this bag of words. So one of the problems we built a column. We we built a matrix that's 26,000 columns. So you, if you think about the human language. There's different things, like the ordering of the words really matter. Like just because you said the word sucks doesn't, like, yeah, you said something negative, but it doesn't mean, like it, you kind of need the whole thing to make, yeah, so I'm going to talk about how we get to that. So we did a, we did a project with Skull Candy a few years ago where we asked them, if someone says the F word in a tweet and they tag you, is that bad? Is that good or bad? And so for higher view, that'd be devastating. Like, please, I hope that never happens. For most of our companies we worked with, no. But right. Skull Candy was smart enough in either demographic they said, we don't really know. Right. And we showed them that it's actually a 50-50 split. So saying the F word and tagging Skull Candy, half the time it's good, half the time it's bad. But the thing that comes out of that, well, that, that's an example to show that this single word thing has some major holes in it. But one of the things that we showed them is if you say my headphones are bad, that's that's pretty negative. But if you say my headphones are badass, totally different. Like it's on not only is it not negative, it's on the opposite end right. of the positive sentiment spectrum. And so the word usage can people can get there using this method by adding this concept of a bigram. Okay. So so I can add a bigram and instead of having twenty six thousand we can just do it really quickly. It's going to produce all the unique words and then all the unique word combos. And so my sparse matrix is just going to explode up. And the reason I like Python so much is they are fantastic examples. So we search SKLearn, 
Python biogram count vectorize. Um, and let's see if we can quickly find a biogram example. I wasn't planning on doing biogram. Uh, number of grams. Gram, in gram. In gram range. So coming back here. Okay, you see what happened to our matrix? So before we had 26,000, or yeah, 26,000 columns. Now we have 242, 475,000 columns. Like, thank goodness this is a sparse matrix, or my laptop would have just hung there. And, and these predictive algorithms also take advantage of the, how sparse the object is, so they're much, much faster. So if you try to do least squares regression, on a whole matrix this size, it's going to crawl, but on the sparse matrix, it, they've already adapted the algorithms to handle this type. So this would start scratching at the bigram. And then what about the trigram? Like, you can try to make it bigger. This bigram is just there. They have to be contiguous. Yeah, exactly. And so that's where deep learning comes in, where, because the problem with that example I gave um, on Skull Candy, if I drop one word in the middle, you're not going to find it. Like you'll not only will you not find it, but you'll kind of misclassify what's actually happening. Um, and so that's where deep learning has really taken off because deep learning is not taking a sparse matrix and populating it. What deep learning is doing is it's actually reading a sequence of text. And um, I can show you some examples with that if we have time. So with deep learning, you you define how many words you're going to look at. You're going to say, I'm going to read 100 words at a time. And so you feed 100 words to the deep learner, and the deep learner is still going to take the words, and it's going to map them to integers. But the deep learner is going to read through those integers, and it has a long-term memory and has a short-term memory. So the deep net will actually figure out, you said this negative word, but you said this word a few words back, and that changes the meaning. And so that so that's where deep learning can kind of revolutionize this approach. But using bag of words with a just with a regular, actually that might kill me with the bigram. But let's see. So I'm gonna I'm gonna fit a Bayesian model here. Let's take a look at our accuracy. So just with a just with a unigram, we got 98.3 accuracy. Still, like the bigram didn't help, which is oh. Ah, that didn't make sense, and this is why it didn't make sense, because I didn't actually do my training test split. So whenever you're building a predictive model, you have to have a validation set. Like, that would be huge in an interview. If somebody was kind of probing and they found out that you weren't thinking about validation sets, that would derail your whole interview, because that's going back to the hedge fund, me getting my hands chopped off. That's how I get my hands chopped off. Like, I have to have a validation set. The validation set can never have any influence over results I'm getting in train. And people will still make mistakes this way. Like, they'll be running a deep learner. They're doing these epics. But their output is the validation score. And they're running these epics like, oh, I really like that validation score. I'm going to stop. <laughs> and it's like, well, yeah, you're doing train validation. But what you just did, you cheated. And you can't do that. So, so what I did is I... There's a function called train test split, and it splits out 70%. Uh, so I've got two thirds I'm going to train on, and then I've got a third I'm holding out, I'm going to test on. So, and if I want to look at, like I can look look at this matrix now. I've got X train shape. So now instead of 1796, it's 1203, and I'm going to fit a model. So before we had 98.3. Still 98.3. That's really strange. Um, the model you're running right now is what kind of model? No, this is just a naive Bayes model. So it's all it's doing is it's looking at the historical um, counts. Like you use these words, and these words led to this. So it's just kind of right, doing like, like a, the atheist or the yeah. So it's just doing a combined probability. So right. you've used these words, and historically the probability for each of these words is this. So the combined probability is this. And, and it actually works pretty well, like 98% accuracy.
for some applications, that's great, and you can run that to production. For other applications, absolutely not. That's never going to work. Um, you mentioned you mentioned one third on your model to keep out. Um, so I was going to say you you we've done that a lot of times on different competitions. So why one third? Why do I always hear one third? So this kind of leads into another discussion where, um, so if I'm building a predictive model and I'm going to predict validation set. It's in my best interest to pr to train the model on as much data as I can, but the trade-off that's happening is, let's say I train on 99% of the data, and I test on this holdout set, and I just happen to get it wrong. That's the accuracies I'm reporting are not statistically valid, like because my sample set is so small, but my training set is huge. So I actually have a pretty good model. And so what people do is they do something called k-folding. And so I, like for production, I would never do this. I would never do a train and a test. I would train, test, train, test. And so what a K-fold does is it takes your set and you cut it up into buckets. So you cut it up into 10 different buckets. If I cut it up into 10 different buckets, now I can train on 90%. I can test on 10%, but I'm not burned because of the small sample size because by doing a K-fold, I actually predicted the entire set. And so the performance metrics I'm getting from all of these validation sets are much more meaningful than this 98.3. Um, and that, and sklearn makes this really, really simple to do. Um, so the other thing to, that will bite you is whenever you're doing a train test split, you, there's this concept of a stratified k-fold. And what one of the things that can happen is if I just take a chunk of the data and I build a model, in, an, in the extreme example, what if in my chunk I had no atheist emails? I built the entire model on Christian emails. What are the chances of that happening? Really, really small, but I got unlucky. And that can totally happen if your labels are in balance. So here we have a pretty even label balance. We can check that. So we're going to, let's just do a sum. Like, let's, let's just see what our labels look like. So if I do print mp sum y, print mp sum y equals zero. So they're pretty well balanced, but I we've built predictive models where less than less than a percent is the label of interest. And to, and that can really mess things up if you don't do a stratified K so what the stratified K fold does is it ensures that the distributions you see in the training set are exactly the same or as close as it can make it in the test set. So you don't get burned by what well, we trained and we had a radically different distribution. Um, so sklearn, always do a stratified k-fold. And it's like they, it's amazing how easy this is. I'll just show you guys really quickly. So so we, before we did train test split, I'm actually just going to bring this in here. And we're going to throw all this away. So the stratified call, it needs to know what your labels are. It has to know that it needs that information when it's doing the cuts. And so we're going to tell it how many folds. So I'm going to tell it, I want you to cut this 10 times. And so that is essentially a 90% train um, if we do that. So it's training on 90%, testing on 10, training on 90%, testing on 10. And then it gives me this cool little for loop that I can now do. And, and the thing it's passing are these indexes. So if an index is like a mapping into the matrix where it's just going to sample, we'll do this, do that. Um, so I define my train test, train test. Um, actually, I have already got all this code written right here. Do K folding a lot. Um, well, it's probably not a good rule of thumb of code on the fly, but. We're crazy, so we're going to hurry and do this. Um, show you guys the difference. So do you, do you guys know why deep learning is so popular right now? Do you guys have a re response? Do you guys know why? Because there's some really powerful algorithms like random forest, gradient boost regression. So what is it about these deep nets that are destroying those regular approaches? Do you guys, you guys don't know? Okay. It's not about your your classification or your preconceived notions. It's 
kind of a black box, right? Well, so deep, so people, some people think of deep learning also as a black box ensemble, but the, the key difference there is if I do gradient booster regression on an image or a random forest, what people normally do is they take an image and they flatten it into a very long vector. And so if I'm trying to predict if you're a man or a woman, the fact that you're, you've got beard material here and a thicker eyebrow here, if I shift the image a few pixels that way, it really hurts those other modeling techniques. Yeah, so, so, like, so if I build, let, let's say a lot of the people I'm training on are centered. I'm building a predictive model, and then on one of the ones I'm validating with, it's shifted. For that old approach, random forest, gradient boost regression, logistic regression, they're just going to blow up. Like They're really going to have a hard time with that shift. But with deep learning, I'm training on a convolution, and it's really robust to shifting. You can shift. If you shift, I'll still catch the activation. Um, and we're, I'm actually going to punt on this K fold and jump into the deep learning because it's important. And so to, sh to tell you how crazy deep learning is, I, so we were trying to hire a deep learning expert uh, during the last five months. And the way I would find them is I would find people by their white papers. You know, you've published something on deep learning, and you've got a white paper. So I would reach out to them, and they all had jobs at Google. And one of the guys got back to me. I was from New York, and I was really excited. I was like, sweet, like, because I I didn't really beat around the bush. I started the email off with whatever offer you're getting from Google or Facebook, we'll beat it. And like I was trying to like pitch immediately, and one of the guys I reached out to from from New York, he reached back and he said, oh yeah, um, I just raised $11 million and I want to sell you my deep learning. Like this is a college student, rather than getting a job, he raised $11 million and he has a deep learning startup. And so that just kind of validates the hype around deep learning. Deep learning is crazy. Uh, Google did one of the largest aqua hires in history, like 400 million for 30 headcount. And, and there wasn't even a product. They just needed that talent. Deep learning. Yeah. Yeah, DeepMind. So deep learning is text. It can handle the sequence reading, which is, and, and you're talking about diminishing returns, like with bigrams, trigrams, with really smart algorithms, XGBS regression and dimension reduction, you're going to get up to like 98, 99% in some cases for some problems. But deep learning will take you to the 99.5. Like that's. That's kind of the difference. And so for people that need world-class prediction, deep learning can deliver it for video, for audio, for text, and for image. So, but, the, but the gain that you get is more in images and audio than with text for deep learning. Yeah. Like we, because we, some of these other text methods, like XGBoost is, some of them are so powerful, they've really eaten. Eat, eat into the gains, um, and there's there's other things you can do with text. Like you can actually something we didn't talk about is normally when people do text NLP, they they take the the words, they do bag of words, and then go to predictive modeling. But you can actually create new features with text, which we don't really think about. So a new feature that was staring us in the face, you saw those emails in there. The problem with emails is they're too unique. So the email by itself is way too unique. It's never, it's not going to show up ever as being important. But if we take that email and we explode it to host name, mm -hmm. if you're getting an email from a .edu versus a Gmail, mm -hmm. that's actually pretty important. Right. But that was totally right. missed with what we just did. And right. so by taking email and exploding it, I just created a feature. Another popular one is if you're analyzing like web logs, you've got the user agent. When I go hit a website, I've got a user agent string that's kind of worthless by itself. But there's algorithms that will take that and they'll tell me, do I have an iPhone? Am I using what browser? They blow it up into all these things. So that's an example of creating features. Another example of creating features is you can use the English language to bucket. Um, yeah, well, yeah, we you, you could bring in a grammar score. Well, that, that would actually be, that could be useful for the email. I do, most of the stuff we deal with is voice to text at Highview, so it's not accurate enough to talk about grammar. Um, but there are similar words that people say all the time that should be 
that should be recognized. And one way to recognize that is you can build up these common word buckets where you have word types that kind of fall in these buckets. So that's an example of building more features that will give you more predictive power. Um, so deep learning, it, this is true of any data science concept. Once someone actually explains it to you at a fifth grade level, and I do feel like all data science concepts can be explained at a fifth grade level, like whether it's random forest, decision trees, gradient based regression, deep learning, if you if you're willing and able to have that fifth grade discussion to understand at that level, you'll you'll realize that a lot of these algorithms are actually pretty simple. Like even deep learning, it's not like it's pretty simple once you understand what what's going on. Um, the big thing to talk about is this concept of convolution, which is foreign to most people if they're if they weren't already using them. So convolutions are very popular in finance. And the reason they're so popular in finance is because of these moving averages that happen with time series data. So if I'm going to trade, um, so this is Forex data on the bottom, but this could be Netflix. So Netflix, they have some negative sentiment online. They're losing their subscription base. They're going down. And now I think I have an opportunity to rebound. Well, one way I can find those opportunities is I can do moving averages. So I have a slow moving average and I have a fast moving average. And when those intersect, that can be interesting. And so um, a lot of financial algorithms, they'll actually train, is this how long of the long moving averages, how short? But that this is such an expensive operation that they do convolutions, because convolutions are the fastest way known to do a moving average. I could do matrix math to do a moving average, but that won't be as fast as a convolution. Um, yeah, well, in convolutions, they work really well on GPUs for speed up. So with deep learning, we're not doing averages. We're doing custom convolution kernels. And so this example up here, this is one dimensional. If I have all the same number, that's a simple moving average. If I actually have numbers in my kernel that are increasing, it's putting more weight on recent data than old data. That's popular in finance. That's an exponentially moving average. But with how convolutions are used in deep learning, they can do very custom things. And so what if I want to have an algorithm where if I see a head and shoulder signal on a stock, it'll activate and say, I saw head and shoulders. I know I saw head and shoulders. But if it sees a double hump, it won't activate. I can do that with a convolution. So just by having a really smart kernel, I can design a kernel that will activate. But that's not a moving average. It's custom. So you start thinking about custom convolutions uh, for deep nets. And that's what we're doing. So um, so this, with the image side, you have two-dimensional convolutions. So you actually have a matrix of numbers that are sliding over the image. And depending on what's happening in the image, they're reacting. And so you think of it as like, if I want to have a convolution that'll find your eye, when it finds an eye, you know, it's got the dark pupil in the center and, and the, the white. When it finds the eye, it'll activate. So I want something that'll react to your eye. Um, and the challenge would be if you actually had to design the numbers in this mm. kernel, that would be a nightmare. Like you don't want to do that. And that's where deep learning will do it for you because it's doing this optimization. It's finding those numbers that will find the eye, find the beard, find these different things. Um, neural nets, you have inputs. You add weights to them. They're added together and you have an output. Um, this is interesting. You have hidden layers in neural nets. And for reference, we have deep nets now that are 100, they'll have 100 uh, million connections or unknowns. And I think Google just announced they have one that has a billion weights or a billion unknowns. And the human brain has a trillion. So during the next decade, for someone like Google or Microsoft to say, we have more connections in our neural net than a human, that's that's actually possible to say. Is this like a custom library that they built that has so many? No, so this this will be on like their equivalent of Im an ImageNet model. And so ImageNet is, they have a deep net that can recognize a thousand different images. So if it's a cat, if it's a dog, if it's a baby, if it's a mother, it'll recognize them. And that model is a, has a billion parameters that they fit. And the interesting thing about 2015, 2015 was the year that all of these deep model deep nets went superhuman. So before it was always about we can predict cats and dogs really, really well. 
but 2015 is now the year that the deep nets beat the humans. Mm -hmm. So the only glaring one that's embarrassing is voice to text. But in the future, you will have voice to text better than humans. But right now, it, we're not there. And and honestly, a, a big part of that is it hasn't had the same. It, it's a hard problem, but it hasn't had the same attention as the image nets. Um, the, there aren't freely available cor corpuses to down. Like it, it's kind of. Where these image nets, I can download 1.4 million images and train a net on it. I can't do that for a voice to text set because they're typically paid sets. Like you have to buy those. Um, there's this idea of an activation. So if you poke my toe right now, I'm not going to react. But if you stab it with a knife, it's going. I'm going to. I'm going to yank my foot away. Same thing with deep nets. These are the activations. So in the past, people had these horizontal tangents. The really popular one now are popular ones now are like the red. And all that's doing is if I have a negative number, I'm going to ignore it. If I have a positive number, I will allow it to continue downstream. They have some more advanced ones that are popular now. So by training it, all you're doing is solving for the weights. And by solving for the weights, you're fitting these convolutions. So we, we could have figured it out on the board what a convolution for an eyeball looks like. We didn't have to because this, this was able to fit it. But not only did it fit it, um, this is the thing I wanted to get to quickly is so how does how does the human mind recognize any object so when you think about your kids and they they bring something to you and say dad this looks like a giraffe and it's not a giraffe what what are they doing what what are we doing when we recognize something when we say a cloud looks like a bunny what are we doing we're doing a feature ensemble so we're seeing the, the ears from the rabbit we're seeing a tail and with these simil similar images, that's President Obama on some toast, you would not make that conclusion if I just gave you the upper right section of toast. You, your mind can't do that. You're not going to say, oh, it looks like Obama's right, the top right corner of his head. No, you're not going to do that because you need the whole thing. And so these feature ensembles, that is what the deep learner is doing. So the deep learner, it's building multiple convolutions, not just one. It'll have like eight. 16, 32, it's building multiple convolutions at multiple layers because you have micro features that are interesting to us and then we have macro features. And so the deep nets are really good at building an ensemble of multiple features at different levels. And this is an example of that. So you have a micro feature, a bigger feature, a bigger feature. So this could be like the corner of your lips. This could be your eye. This could be you've got a beard. This could be the shape of your, the whole shape of your head, and the the way it gets the different levels of features, it does something called max pooling, which we don't have time to get into. Um, sorry, I'm jumping through these quickly. So this is an example we actually did. So we we wanted to build a predictive model that could just look at your face and tell if you're a man or a woman, and that training set, the size we wanted doesn't exist. Um, and so one way to cheat that, so when you're thinking about labeled sets, sometimes you can cheat. And so one way to cheat that is we said, well, in our database of millions of interviews, how about we just take the names that have very high probability, like Benjamin, sure, there's a woman somewhere in the US named Benjamin, but that occurrence is so low. And we actually, we, we did test the error rate on the set. We had half a percent error rate. But that was good enough to build a, a great model. So we. So we were able to quickly build out a training set. These are all the images of men, all the images of women. Um, getting back to that normalization or the demeaning, this is the average human face that we're going to subtract out. So the one on the right is the average human. The, these are just interesting. We don't actually use them. That's the average male, the average female. And so for the first pass, we built it on just half the face. Now we do the whole face. Because we, we sim the face is symmetric, so we can build a predictive model on half the face. And then we, we attempted to help it. Sometimes with deep nets, you'll actually help it by producing a new feature. So sometimes when you're producing new features, that's good. The deep nets can find features on, on, on their own. If you're doing audio fingerprinting, it'll find it. But if you add a spectrum with the raw audio to help it, with image, if you add something, it can help. So who's, who's the toughest James Bond? So Sean, young Sean Connery was the only one that it was predicted to be a woman, yeah. and I'll, and I actually know why this happens. The reason it happened is his face is not symmetric, and the first model we built is, uh, it's a half face model. The model we use now, it's 
full face, it actually handles tilted faces, and it it identified him just fine. We've seen this before, and I gave the wrong oh. answer last time. Oh, you did. <laughs> so this is what I was the most proud of. So our training set, and this gets to model generalization. So our training set was trained on interview data, full like frontal faces, but it got the male alien and the female alien right. So how on earth did it get these right? The reason it got them right is because all these convolutions at multiple layers were similar enough. You've got the eyelashes, you've got the you know the lips, you've got the nose. It was able to figure out that that's a man and that's a woman. Um, and then this one failed because there's no one in the training set that has a beard, long hair, and an open uh, open shirt, which is we we've since redone this. So the first pass we got 98 percent. Now we get 99.7 percent accuracy. So our new model now gets all of these right. It gives them all 100%. Um, and so if you do want to use deep learning, you can't. You realistically can't do it without the GPUs. So if you're not using a GPU, then you're waiting months to get results where it could take you a day to get the same results. And so that's really important. You have to learn quickly. You have to be iterating. And so if you want to learn deep learning, I would suggest fire up a GPU instance. You can even do a spot. If you don't know what a spot instance is, it's, a, it's much cheaper. It's, you save 90% off the cost. And what it means is you could lose your instance at any moment, but typically they'll last. We've had some last for weeks. Um, yeah, so play around with that. And GPUs, the reason GPUs are so much faster is they have so many cores. So on this laptop, I've got eight cores, but on some of these GPU cards, you have thousands and thousands of cores. And these, these have been pushed by gaming. Think like, you know, if pe people think gamers don't actually help society, but really they do. <laughs> so because of the gaming interest, these GPUs are decades ahead of where they would have been without that. And in when you're doing a rendering, if you're playing Call of Duty or something, and you've got, you know, this ray tracing, different things, that's actually a bunch of matrix math. And so a lot of these algorithms port pretty nicely to the GPU, and. When we've tested it, we see like a 32x speed up on some of our deep learning runs. Um, so Are you doing all of this on AWS? We do everything on AWS. Yep. Um, I think I should probably end it there and just open up for questions so we can make sure that. Um, uh, or I'm happy to go longer too, but what did you have in mind? Because I can. Okay. So I want to know what questions you guys have or what you're thinking about or what problems you're excited about or or maybe intimidated by. Um, On the GPU clusters, so, you know, I understand that it's a video card that's normally doing that. What is the GPU node on AWS? Is it just... Is it just another box that has lots and lots of cores? Or? Well, they have two. So there's two GPU instances. So one of them, you only have access to one GPU. And another one, you have access to four. Okay. So you could actually run an algorithm that's hitting four GPUs. Okay. Um, then beside, beyond that, you have to do multi-node GPU processing, okay. which is um, that should have been state of the art four years ago in data science, but it's still kind of state of the art right now. Like if you want to do 10 nodes on Amazon GPU and have a deep net that's solving the whole thing, yeah. you're, you're not going to find a tutorial. Right. You're like, have to do it yourself. Well, is this normally, it is, what's different about the code that you have to put on that? Is this the same Python code kind of being shown? Or do so you have to write the, code, the code that actually runs on the GPU um, is, for this case, it's CUDA. <laughs> So CUDA is uh, specific to NVIDIA. They do have a new standard that came out called OpenCL. Mm -hmm. But the, in the Open, OpenCL is nice because it fails gracefully to the CPU, which CUDA does not do. Yeah. Or at least when I was using CUDA, it didn't. It would, it was, the GPU did not have available memory or to operate it. It would just, like, just have an epic blow up. Just yeah, just die. Um, but the problem with these two language jobs is NVIDIA has been so far ahead of the game because NVIDIA was first to offer this to the market. Their language is so much more mature, has so many more plugins, there's so many more vendors that are working with that language that OpenCL just hasn't seen the traction to compete. So everyone that does GPU computing, the majority of them use CUDA, 
Python uh, has a wrapper called Piano, which um, greatest, uh, let's see, get. So if you guys were at my, oh shoot. Uh, I was hoping that would make it easy to find. Um, so I do have a deep learning tutorial that goes through Theano. And all Theano is doing is it's a Python wrapper that sits on top of C++, which sits on top of CUDA. So you don't have to learn CUDA. I would not recommend learning CUDA. You, do, you can just use Theano, and it will port your Python objects to the GPU. And something that's kind of foreign is when you're doing GPU computing, you have to treat the GPU as a separate computer. Like it has a separate memory, separate separate GPU. So I can have a deep learner just cranking away my GPU. My CPUs are just they're idle. They're not doing, not doing anything. And if I want to be passing stuff back and forth from GPU memory to CPU memory, that's bad. There's a cost with doing that. So if you're passing stuff back and forth, um, that can eat into your gains. So usually what people do is they they build a data set, they put the whole, they put a batch of the data set on the GPU, they solve all the errors, they bring it back. And I and I'll I'll post a link to that deep learning tutorial. So if anyone wants to go through that piano notebook, they can actually see the there's this concept of a micro batch of deep learning because you physically can't fit 1.4 million images on the GPU, because the GPU only has eight gigs of memory. And so what people do is they do this idea of micro batching where they'll take a section of the training set and they port it. Like with HireView, we took a group of here's a thousand images. Remember the stratify K folding. We want, even with the micro batches, we want a really good representation of multiple classes if we can. Sometimes you just can't do that because you're doing, we're doing some deep learning now on just raw video and we just can't, you're running into memory constraints where you're only allowed to shove like two things on the GPU. Um, so you can't do that. Um, so that, that's how the trading process takes place is you put it in. And one of the things with deep learning is you never want the sample set you send to the GPU, you never want it to look the exact same twice. Uh, so with image, the great thing people do is they do, they call it data augmentation. So I have an image of a cat. I took a thousand images of cat and dogs. I threw it on the GPU. It cranked away and it spit out an error. It knows the error because it knows my output, spit out an error. The next time I take the same images to put them on, I shift all of them. I have a horizontal shift. I shift them 10%. I even rotate them, which is popular with image processing. I'll give them some rotation. And I'll even add some noise, because I never want, that'll help me with overfitting. If I send the exact same data set to the GPU every time, I'm going to overfit my data set. I'm going to have a useless model. So data augmentation is really important whenever you're dealing with. And surprising with, with Caldi, Caldi is the number one open source voice to text library. There's no data augmentation, mm -hmm. which is like, that shows you the state of voice to text. Like, yeah. they're not even thinking about data augmentation. Or I think they're starting to, but it's like, come on, guys. Caldi is spelled a K, so K A L D I. It's super nasty. It's written by an academic. It's a bunch of like Bash and Perl, C. Ah. So, yeah. it's a job done. so, Higher view, we're trying to incentivize some BYU students right now to write a Python only open source voice to text library mm -hmm. because we know what to do with that. We know how to put that on the GPU, we know how to speed it up. And I, I think once you see that happen, you're going to see rapid adoption. A lot of people will jump into voice to text who weren't playing there. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. So when you're when you're doing this stuff, are you taking some of the, the libraries to do the neural nets and then implementing the CUDA wrapper in, all in Python to push them in? Or? So Theano takes care of all of that for you. Um, I can oh, to get uh, there. We go. Ah, this is what I wanted to show you guys. So this. So Python makes this really easy. So this is just a, a notebook I posted. So here we're loading a handwritten data set. So I've got 70,000 handwritten uh, digits from 0 to 9. You have to predict, is this a 5 or is it a 9? 
and you'll see the data set's actually really messy. Like the fours look like nines. Like look at this. Like yeah, that's a four and that's a nine, but there's some nines that look just like fours. So from this data set, can I build a predictive model that'll predict what's going on? So this is the deep learning. I just import Theano. I have these wrappers. Um, stochastic gradient descent. That's my optimizer. And here I define my model. And the funny thing about this is this is deep learning at a really low level. Like if you follow this cell by cell, line by line, there's no mysteries here. There's nothing I'm hiding in the corner. This is raw deep learning. But if I scroll down to the bottom, because maybe I'm going to say, well, I don't have time for that. Mm -hmm. I can scroll down here. This is the Keras library, which is a Theano wrapper. And it makes this stupid easy, where I've defined my model here. And now I'm going to solve it right here. And I'm going to do data augmentation. So this is all built into Keras. So Keras is doing, it's rotating my images randomly between 20 degrees. It's shifting them by 20% randomly every single time it sends it to the GPU. And it's only like 20 lines of code. Um, yeah, so I'll post this, a link to this notebook. Uh, Keras is very popular, K-E-R-A-S, uh, with deep learning right now, because it's a fantastic library. It has great documentation. It's written by someone at Google, which is hilarious, because TensorFlow sucks. And Keras is better than TensorFlow when it comes to just like your uh, deep learning tutorials. Yeah, he's got so to communicate. Yeah. But, yeah, if you guys have any more questions, you can tweet at me or send me an email and something comes up. Well, we'll just or, reply to that group with the links. And then I'll get the links from you, too, and I'll post them back to these YouTube videos those as well. Twitter handle on there, too. Yeah. Thanks, okay. Thanks, yeah. guys. Hey. Thanks, guys. <laughs> you can go to the session in the bottom right yep. and end the session.